Okay, hello. So today we're going to take a look at C++ classes. And we've got an example here creating an animal class which has some public methods and variables. Public means that it's accessible outside of the class. And later we'll see that private means that any of those functions or variables are only accessible from inside of the class. Now, here, after we say that there is going to be a function that returns void called bark, and a variable which is an integer called age, that function is defined after the class definition, because the definition of the class, or the class header, starts here and ends here. The semicolon ends the class header. Now comes the implementation of that function called bark. We know this function called bark belongs to the animal class because the function starts with the name of the class animal and then the scope resolution operator, that it, which is two full colons. It's just one C out. Now we have another class called dog, and again that also has a bark function, and it is defined below here. Then we can actually create an instance of the class animal here on line 24, and we can set its age, we can ask the animal instance A to bark, and we can do the same thing to the instance of the dog class. And that's, that's a very simple example. Let's move on. So the next uh, example that we're going to do is here. In this one, at the beginning, we have, again, a class called animal. But in this case, we've declared this virtual uh, this class noise to be virtual. This means that we can override this function in a subclass or an inherited class as we are doing here. We're creating a dog class which inherits from animal and we have again declared this noise function as being uh, virtual, but it's notice here I've said noise method is virtual if we declare it as virtual or not because the base class noise is virtual. So in other words, we don't have to declare this virtual here. It's not, it's not necessary because it's already declared virtual in the base class. Mind you, what is the purpose of declaring this function as being virtual? Yes, we can override it in subclasses like dog because in this case dog inherits from animal because we've actually notice the difference here in the in the header look at line 16 and look at line 5 notice animal isn't inherited from anything but on the other hand when we come down to the dog class there's a full colon here and now we're saying okay we're going to inherit this from animal so now if we I'm going to kind of, for the moment, I'm going to skip what inline means right now. I'm going to come down here. But I want to really focus in on what this virtual function purpose, or what the purpose of this virtual function is. So if we come down here, notice that here, animal pointer AP, AP stands for animal pointer, is equal to the address of D. And notice D is a dog. So notice, instead of creating a dog pointer to, to point to dog, notice that we have created a animal pointer pointing to dog. Now, essentially what this means is that we have created a base class pointer. Animal is the base class, and that's the type of our pointer. But it's now pointing to a dog. And we've also created 
a dog pointer, which is also pointing to the, to the dog object we created. We can also make a cat pointer. Now, if you scroll up, if we scroll up a little bit, we notice, hey, you know what? The cat is also inherited from animal. But the, the purpose behind this virtual function declaration is so that we can actually achieve polymorphism. Now, polymorphism, OK, so let's, let's kind of think about the concept of polymorphism here. So let's say in C++, we have a vector. When we create a vector in C++, we have to specify the type here, what type it is. And when we do that, the vector v will contain a number of items that are all the same. So if we put int here, then they all have to be integers. If we put some other type of data type in there, then they all have to match that data type. And wouldn't it be nice if we could have a vector of a variety of different things, which were slightly related to each other? So for example, what if we had a base class called animal? And then from animal, what if we had, what if we derived classes called a cat, a dog, let's say, and a bird? Now obviously we can change this to be different things. But my point is that could we then store these different data data types, the cat, the bird, and the dog, inside this one vector. So this is now, this can be achieved using polymorphism. And the way this is done is this vector will be a vector of animal pointers. And when it's a vector of animal pointers, that pointer, if this one points to a cat object and this one points to a dog object, even though they're all animal pointers, and this one, let's say, points to a bird object, an instance of a bird object, then if we call noise on the cat, it'll, it should say meow. If we call noise on the dog, it should say rough rough and if we call it on the bird it should say tweet and that's the purpose of declaring those functions as being virtual is because it lets us override it for subclasses and now we can use runtime binding so let's go back to the code and I'll show you what I mean so here's our code again, and the example I'd like to show you is that you notice here, of course, animal, animal pointer points to the dog. If I scroll a little bit further up, there you go, you see that D is a dog, and I'm setting it to the address of D. Then, down here, when I call speak, now notice here what's speak going to do. Speak is, speak is a function that accepts an animal pointer that animal pointer then calls noise. But I've, you see noise is a, has been declared as a virtual function and it's over, overridden in the subclasses. So here we've set it as being a virtual function in the base class and here, although we don't necessarily need to put void, but we, we have definitely overridden it for dog, which is rough rough, and for cat, it's meow. Okay. So when we run this here where it has AP noise, animal pointer points to a dog object. Same thing here. Okay. This is so if we run it, let's run it. There we go. And we notice animal pointer noise is rough rough because it's pointing to a dog. The dog pointer should obviously also do rough rough because the dog pointer points to a dog. 
and the cat pointer says meow for noise. Same thing for AP. It's just calling a function through another function. And then there's a vector example here. So if I show you, if we go back to the code, here's the vector example. I'm initializing the vector to be the dog pointer and the cat pointer. And I'm calling speak on those um, pointers. And so if, if I add the, if I add um, the animal pointer in here, Now, if we run it, you'll notice the first one, which was the animal pointer, is saying rough. Because again, the, the pointer is pointing to a dog object. So that's, in a nutshell, that's polymorphism. Also, notice, did you see the warning when I, compi when I compile this and run it? Uh, I have a warning. It says, deleting an object a po uh, of polymorphic class cat, which has non-virtual non destructor, might cause undefined behavior. So when you have the delete for cat, let's go take a look at cat. It, it, notice it says, where do we call delete for cat? Right there, right? But we did not declare a virtual destructor for cat. So if we come up, Here's cat. That's it. There's no destructor declared for it. The destructor should be virtual in order for delete to work properly. So let's take a look at the next example. Here's C3. Notice in this one, because we have a virtual base class function, right, which makes this class a virtual class, now we have our dog destructor here, but also notice that our cat, well, where's our cat? Uh, no, there, that's the one right there. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, destructor must be virtual and must exist in the base class. Okay, now when we destroy the cat here. This should not create a warning anymore. So if we compile and run this, notice now there's no more error. So that's a good thing. Okay, so just to reiterate, let's focus in on what we've done here. Um, this vector here, okay, it's not, it doesn't have ints, it has animal pointers. That means technically the things inside the vector are all animal pointers, here, 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 here. But they, those pointers point to different subclasses of animal, like a cat, a dog, and a bird. Therefore, essentially, what we've been able to do is we've been able to create a vector that contains accessors to different types of objects, which is something we've never been able to do before in C++. We've always had to have our containers, our vector containers, homogeneous. Homogeneous in the sense that everything inside of there has to be of the same type. And yet now we have the ability for some of them to be cats, some of them to be dogs, and some of them to be birds. Although technically, as I mentioned, they're all animal pointers. But because of runtime binding, which is called polymorphism, it says, OK, now I know which function to call because those functions are virtual functions. And I'll call it based on the type of object that I'm dereferencing. De if it's a cat, I'll, I'll call the noise for cat and make the meow. So that's the concept here. That's our new power of polymorphism. OK, one thing I want to also touch upon in this example is the use of declaring a variable in the class as being static. So notice here on line 25, we're saying that count 
is a static variable. Now, what does that actually do? Essentially, remember, all variables are tied to an instance of the class. In other words, if we have three dogs, then each and every dog instance is going to have their own copy of the count variable. However, if you declare a variable as being static, then that variable is now a class level variable and it is shared with all the instances of that class. In other words, each and every instance of the dog class does not have its own count. There's only one count instance and it's a class level instance, but all dogs, all dog instances have access to that static variable. Now what's the purpose behind this? So for example, here I'm using count, which means that if, if you create a dog, we're going to increase count. Notice here in the uh, constructor, we're increasing count. So if, in other words, if a dog is born, if you create one, we'll increase count. Also notice that if a dog is destroyed, we're going to decrease it. Okay? Therefore, we don't want to do that We'd, we wouldn't want to change that value. If, there, if there's a hundred dogs and you destroy one of them, you know, if it goes out of scope, let's keep this uh, humane here. If it goes out of scope and um, it's no longer accessible, then we don't want to update, we don't want to subtract one from every other dog that is still uh, accessible. It makes much more sense to have that as a class variable and then any instance of the dog can access that variable without having to have a hundred copies of it if we have a hundred dogs. That's the purpose of static. Okay. Okay, there's another topic which I kind of forgot to go over and that is this concept of, of declaring a function to be inline. If you put this inline declaration in the beginning of a function, essentially what you're doing is you're asking the compiler to put the code of this function in place of a function call when it's creating the binary executable. Now, usually you only do this for really short, short, short functions that are you know a couple lines of code. Um, but the, as far as I remember, the compiler is not obligated to listen to you. In other words, it may do it, but it also might not. Honestly, in terms of declaring things inline, it's, um, it's just, it's not really required in any way for the code. It's usually done for performance reasons to uh, subvert the function call overhead, but you can have perfectly fine code without declaring anything as being inline. However, just to, just to be clear, sometimes you will notice that people actually put their function implementation directly in the class header. So I'll say that again. Putting the function implementation directly in the class header as I've done for the cat noise function. Notice for dog, dog noise is not inside the class header. So notice the class header is here. Okay, We just declare the function what it accepts, what it returns, but the implementation is down here outside of the header. Okay, Whereas in this situation here, the the class header contains not only the function definition, but also the implementation of the function, the C out uh, line. In that case, uh, it's basically the same thing as saying, hey, I'd like this thing to be inlined. 
Um, personally, I think it's a good idea if you separate your, your class header from the actual implementation of the functions. Partially, the par partial reason for this is because later on when your code gets bigger, you want to be able to separate the implementation and the header file into separate files. One of the header files will be a .h file and the implementation files could be like a .cc or a .cpp file. And, and now that's, um, that makes much more sense for people who are using your class because they don't actually have to understand how it's implemented. They can just look at the header file and see what, you, what the functions take and what they return and they can actually utilize the class that you have written. So they can, they can utilize it. They don't have to know how it works internally. Okay, so here we have another example. And in this one, we've uh, introduced a little bit of a problem, which we're going to have to deal with. So notice here that this animal class, which is the base class, yes, it has this virtual noise function, just as we did before. But in addition, it has a pointer, specifically an integer pointer. Notice we have also declared the destructor as being virtual as well. Remember, uh, I may not have mentioned this earlier, but destructors are not called manually. Destructors are called when uh, an object goes out of scope. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. So here is our example, and we are on line 10, and we notice that this, cl this animal class has an integer pointer. Now, the constructor for the animal class calls new int. OK, so we've allocated some memory on the heap when we create an animal. And then the destructor deletes that pointer. So when, the, when that instance goes out of scope, if, if, so like I'll give you an example. So I was looking for an animal class, but actually dog is a subclass of animal. So when we create a new dog instance on line 89, the age of the dog is allocated on the heap. Now we don't need to worry about deleting that because on line 108, dog D is going to go out of scope. And that means the destructor for D will be called. That means the age uh, allocated memory on the heap for that integer will be deleted because our destructor calls delete. So notice again, if I scroll up to what I'm talking about here, when you construct the animal, and of course dog is a subclass of animal, we're going to allocate the new memory on the heap, but when it goes out of scope, it's going to be freed. Okay, And it goes out of scope when the variable goes out of scope. So in that case, it was in int main, so when the program ends, it'll go out of scope. Um, here, we have a little bit more of an example here with the subclass dog. And notice we're initializing the static member at file scope. So we can't initialize it uh, in the constructor of the dog because remember, the count variable is not tied to an instance. So there's a little bit of uh, verbiage here that you can have a look at. But essentially, um, here we have the dogs constructor and destructor. And we have cat, 
But essentially, the, the rest of the code's not that much different as what we've seen before. OK, let's talk about one of the problems that's going to arise in our code right now. I've kind of mocked something up here. I've said, let's just pretend that we have this class called dog. My, I'm just writing pseudocode right now. And let's say the dog has some members in it. Okay. Uh, you know, let's just pretend. Let's say it's an int, and let's say it's a string. Doesn't matter what they are, except there's no pointers. And now we create an instance of the dog class, and then we pass the, this instance to a function called foo. Now here's our function foo. That means that, remember, in C++, it's the default is copy by value. That's the default in C++. That means, that means this object that instance d gets copied, and now in the function scope, it has to be copied to x. So let's think about how C++ does this. It, it actually, you don't have to do this because C++ does it all for you, but it basically it iterates over the, the integer and the string and whatever other things you have stored in this class. And it copies them one by one, and it puts them into the instance x. So in other words, if d had an integer and a string, then now x is going to have that same integer and the same string. So really, there's no problem. Everything's working as it should. The problem arises when one of your uh, variables or, or objects inside your class is a pointer. Now, think about what happens. C++, by definition, will actually go in and copy each item, as we discussed earlier, one by one. So it copies the integer, puts the integer into the copy of x. So now x has the same integer as d does. x now has the same string as d has. OK, great. Now comes the problem. All right. So now we've got an integer pointer, but what, what is here? It's an address. It's a pointer. So what does it do by default? It just simply copies the address and puts it into here. And it's done, right? Uh-oh, there's a problem. Now, this guy, x, points to the same thing, that or that member of it, points to the same thing that d does. So if you, for example, in here, if you go, you know, x and you change the p pointer, right? Um, so in other words, if we went like x dot p, and now that's a pointer, right? And we like dereference it and set it equal to something. OK, well, now guess what? we've now changed something inside D. So essentially, it's like passing it by reference. Now, we don't want that to happen. We don't want to be able to affect D if we change something in X. OK? Um, also, now, there, there's another problem, too. For example, what if the destructor, so like, okay, so this function, um, I kind of, let me write this part again. Like right here, that's the end scope of the function, right? So at this point, x is destroyed, right? So that if x is destroyed, that means the destructor for x is called. Now, wait a sec, what is x? Well, x is a dog, right? That means the dog destructor is going to be called. And remember, what was in our dog destructor? Well, the base class called delete on the pointer, right? So guess what happens now? Not only could we change it, but also 
we've now deleted that memory. So now let's go back after the function call. Guess what? Now we've got a big time problem because if we try and access the pointer of, of the dog, now this is going to create an error because it's going to say, well, you already deleted it because we deleted the pointer. We see that's the problem. We passed the pointer. We don't want to do this. So how can you avoid this problem? Answer, here it comes. You have to create a copy constructor. That's the solution. So what does this copy constructor look like? So here is our copy constructor on line 21. Notice the animal constructor is here. Great, OK. We're calling new on the pointer, age pointer. But then inside the copy constructor, which, which by the way, gets called when we pass a you might say, OK, well, when is the copy constructor called? Well, that's, that's called when you have a copy required. And you have a copy required when you pass an instance to a function. That's one, that's one uh, example of when the copy constructor gets called, which is what we were describing earlier. So now, this is what happens by default, right? R look at the arguments here in the um, input arguments. So what, what we pass here is x by reference. Okay, That means that the x, right, we're going to set the new instance to whatever x is. But instead of copying the pointer, what we're going to do is we're going to create for this, for this copy we're going to create a new, we're going to allocate new memory for, for the pointer. And then we're going to assign this new memory that we've just allocated. Because remember, every instance has this pointer, right? That's part of the class. That's up here. This, this age p pointer exists for all animals. So when we create, when we copy it, this is already going to be copied. OK, great. But now we, we need this thing to hold its own copy, a separate copy of the original. And now this is how we do it. In order to create a new copy, we need new space for it. That's why we're calling new. And then here we assign. We're saying dereference the age pointer and assign it equal to the dereference of x, which is the object we're sending. OK? That's what the syntax for the copy constructor should look like. Um, the, other, the other thing is uh, the assignment operator here. OK? What is that? What's the purpose of? defining that. So for that guy, essentially, imagine if you had two objects. Let's say you went, uh, let's say you had int main, and then you had an animal, A. And then, for example, you had a uh, an if statement, it doesn't matter what it is. But now, inside here, you could go animal B. And then you would say, okay, well, let's just say that's equal to A. Well, again, now we're doing, we're running into the same problem we had with the copy constructor. We don't want just to copy addresses. We want B to have its own um, copy of what A's pointer points to. So if we look at the code, <coughs> here is the assignment operator. Now in this case, we're not actually allocating new memory. 
right? Because that's, out, that's already done with the constructor. But what we are doing is we're assigning the uh, deep copy. We're assigning the deep copy. So what the pointer points to is going to be what the other pointer points to in the, um, so B is going to be the same value. L let, me, let me explain it like this with the image here. The pointer of B here is going to have is going to be equal to this guy here. So this is going to make sure that we don't have other problems with our class. So the in C++ there's a rule of three. It says that <coughs> when you have pointers in the class, you're going to need to overload the you're going to have to have your destructor virtual. You're going to have to um, define your copy constructor and your assignment operator. And there's the syntax to do it. So the, the next thing I wanted to look at is the insertion operator. And the insertion operator is essentially if we want to be able to use C out with an object, uh, or with an instance of the class that we've just created. So in this case, in this case, like a dog, how does this work? Well, the insertion operator is basically like a function call, and it's going to return an output stream by reference, and it's going to accept an output stream by reference, and then the, the dog object by reference and it's const because we're not going to change it. We're just going to print it to the screen. But we're, we're going to print. What are we going to print? That's what we have to decide here. So now O, re remember how this is called. Okay, so maybe I should like put an example here as to how this is actually called. What, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be going C out, whoops, and let's say let's say A is a dog, okay? Then to the left of the insertion operator is the stream, okay? That gets passed. Now what is that stream? It's the C out stream. Then the dog is passed by reference as X. So in this case, it's A. So therefore we have O is the C out stream. So it's C out age. And the insertion operator again, of course, age is just a string. This is going to be the age of the dog, x dot age. Another string, another string, and an, another attribute of the class. Okay? And then we return O. Now, why do we return O? And what was O? O was the O was the output stream by reference, in this case C out. Why do we return it? The answer is because a lot of times you don't really want that to be the end of your statement. Sometimes you could do this. So now you want to, let's say you want to go C out A and then C out something else after it. So now essentially what you're doing is you're saying, okay, that means this here must be the same stream you sent A to which is C out. So after printing A, you want to print B. And that's exactly what returning O helps you do. So that's the syntax for the insertion operator.